Well, welcome to another Friday night. We're continuing our reparenting series, and I hope what you're realizing is that when a person doesn't get good tools in childhood, there's a lot of tools to learn if you're going to parent yourself. And what I want to look at today is every parent has to help their child learn how to face adversity. And what's important to understand, I think, up front with that is that adversity is part of life. Adversity is something that no one is exempt from. And why I want to emphasize that is because I think for some people, when they come into recovery and they look at this reparenting thing, they have this fantasy that they're not even aware of that says, if I do the right things and I grow to a certain point, then I won't have adversity. Life will just be smooth all the time. But the reality of reparenting is... I'm never going to reach this place where everything's smooth all the time. I'm going to continue to face adversity. And so I need to develop tools to parent myself through that adversity. I really appreciated something that Dr. Brene Brown has written. Um, and basically it's what is the bravest thing that parents can do to help their children become mature and healthy? Such an important question for parents. And here's the answer. Let their children struggle and experience adversity. And here's what she said. As I travel across the country, there seems to be a growing concern on the part of parents that children are not learning how to handle adversity or disappointment because we're always rescuing and protecting them. It's not that our children can't stand the vulnerability of handling their own situation. It's that we can't stand the uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure, even when it's the right thing to do. In other words, our kids can handle the adversity. It's the parents that get all upset and worked up and panicky and full of anxiety. So we try to make an easier life, not for the kids' benefit, but for our benefit. And so kids need adversity to grow. And they're not resistant to it. It's the parents that often struggle with it. So let me talk about adversity. What do I mean when I talk about adversity? So adversity can be basically the problems that we face in life, the setbacks, the disappointments. It can include failure, obstacles to obtaining the goals we have set, opposition that we get to the path we're on, persecution we might get from others, being surpassed by others. That can be adversity. Being let down by others who were helping us or said they were going to help us. So adversity comes in many guises, but it is part of life. Some adversity, when we face it, it can be resolved quickly. Other adversity, it goes on for a long time. It may take months, years before it's ever resolved. And so it's stuff we just have to sit in and learn how to manage. It's important to point out that adversity, sometimes it's kind of like waves hitting a beach. So you go for times where there's no adversity. Everything's going smoothly. And then all of a sudden, crash, you get one adversity after another that just hits you in the face. Or you might go al along with mild adversity that you're managing quite well, but then all of a sudden you get three, four adversities all at once that just overwhelm you. So adversity it, you can't predict the intensity, how it's going to happen. Let me just talk about three different sources of adversity. It's so important to understand this as we learn tools for dealing with adversity. So some adversity is just based on external circumstances, things beyond our control. There's a downturn in the economy. It results in losing your job beyond your control, but boy, does it make life hard. 
you get sick or your child gets very sick and, and it's a severe sickness that goes on for a while oh that makes life very difficult beyond your control your car gets stolen all of those are external circumstances beyond your control but boy they make life difficult and challenging then there's a second source and that's people people that don't necessarily like you people like bullies that just need to pick on somebody to try to prove to themselves they're better than others or you might get a boss that for some reason just doesn't like you and, and gives you unfair working circumstances and more work than he gives others and all kinds of just frustrating things or you might have a family member that doesn't like you and they just attack you regularly or you might have a a family that just doesn't like the growth they see in you and so they're always putting pressure on you to go back to the way you were they're criticizing the stuff they see in you so it's other people that are negative critical bullying unfair all of that creates adversity but there's a third source and it's ourself it's the adversity we bring on ourselves, and that is due to bad decisions that we've made in the past and now we're experiencing the negative consequences of those decisions so let's say you've lied for many many years to everybody and now you're living with the adversity that nobody trusts you or let's say you manipulated or were a control freak for years and years and now you're living with the consequence that your children don't want to hang around you your children don't trust you your children don't want a relationship with you that is difficult hard stuff to deal with all brought on by yourself may have been 20 years ago where you were making some of those decisions but now you're living with the consequences and it is adversity the next important part as an introduction is to understand that there are degrees of adversity from very mild adversity to severe adversity so mild adversity might be your you're in a hurry to get somewhere and the traffic is slow and bottled up or all of a sudden you get a patch of really unpleasant weather and it's miserable outside and you can't do the stuff you normally do or you really want to get a new TV and your partner is dead set against it or you got cut from the basketball team or you really wanted to ace an exam but you only got a B all of those are adversities they're frustrations they they bother you and so they might result in you getting angry you getting frustrated you getting down for a while you're in a bad mood for a day or so as you try to kind of resolve that but then you just move on you accept it you move on you've had your little grieving um, and and you it's, you're okay again for some coming out of complex trauma though mild adversity can trigger deep issues that are important to understand getting cut from a basketball team, not acing an exam the way you are, being criticized or told you can't get that TV, that can trigger deep shame. I'm not good enough, nobody likes me. And that can then have ramifications that trigger a whole bunch of other things. Or it can trigger ODD. You say, I can't do that, I'm gonna do it anyways. And, and, and all of that can lead to some unhealthy decisions. And so what you need to understand is for people coming out of complex trauma mild adversity that others can get through very quickly it can be a big deal it can really mess them up because it's triggering some really big stuff but then there's the severe end of the spectrum of adversity and that can be where you're physically attacked or sexually attacked or you lose someone super close to you or you 
have an abrupt loss of a relationship. All of a sudden, you thought it was going well, and it's been going well for years, and all of a sudden they say, I'm out of your life, or they cheat on you. That just rocks your world. Or you can be told, you, sorry, you've lost your job, and now you have no income coming in, and the bills are piling up. All of those severe adversities, they just don't get you a little bit upset. They rock your world. They lead to deep fear, deep anger, deep grief, because there's huge loss involved. For many people, it takes them to depression. It takes them to disillusionment with life. It takes them to a crisis point where they have a crisis of faith or they're just super confused about what's the point of life, what's the point of doing healthy behaviors, what do I do to get my life on track? It's just a dark, difficult time. So I want to just say I'm going to talk about that next week. I want to do a whole talk on it because it's so critical. But for people who come out of complex trauma to hit severe adversity, it doesn't just rock their world, it triggers fight, flight, freeze. It basically says everything now is unsafe. You need to go into survival mode. You need to go to the old ways of surviving. And they feel a powerful pull to do that. And so that leads, for many people, I need to go back to medicate this pain because I can't get rid of it. So they relapse to drugs, they relapse to food or some other addiction. And so it's a very dangerous time for them when severe adversity hits. Now let me just take you in a little different direction that maybe you haven't thought of before. I want you to think about adversity and hope. And I want you to think about the fact that adversity is actually the pathway to gaining hope. So, Brene Brown has said, if we want our children to develop high levels of hopefulness, we have to let them struggle. They've got to go through lots of adversity because adversity Getting through adversity successfully leads to growing hopefulness. So let me just talk about hope. Often we refer to hope just as an emotion. But I want you to understand there's really three building blocks to realistic hope, to ever getting to the emotion of hope. And they're all basically part of thinking and acting. So. A person starts with a goal. The ability to set realistic goals. In five years, I want to be here. Okay? Then they have to have a realistic pathway to that goal. In order to get to that goal, I need to do this, this, this. I need to do it in this order. I need to change this in my life. I need to let this go. And they lay out the path to get to the goal. That becomes so important. Then they need the third part, which is agency. And that is they need to believe that they can get to the goal, that they need to have the tools to get to the goal, and they need the support of others. So that's the realistic aspects of hope. It's all about being able to set realistic goals Figure out how to get there and have the support and tools and belief in self to get there. Such an important thing. And so part of all of that is dealing with adversity as you go on this path to your goals. And as you deal with that adversity, it just causes your ability to hope to grow even more. So let me bring in complex trauma and this whole adversity hope thing. In a healthy home, a parent is a, supporting a child 
So number one, to set realistic goals, to get the right pathway, to think it through. Then they support the child and, and help them believe in themselves. So they do all of that. Then the second thing the parents do is when a child encounters adversity, they help them solve the problem, they encourage them. And so the child, they might have times of failure, times of frustration, but because of all that support and tools, they gain resilience, they bounce back with healthy tools, and that leads to hopefulness. Complex trauma. What are the two things? Well, number one, the parents didn't help them set realistic goals, help them have realistic path, didn't help them believe in themselves. They had shame, they were criticized, they were never good enough. And so they don't have that first piece of healthy gaining of hope. Then when they encountered adversity, parents blamed them, parents punished them, parents didn't support them, parents didn't help them resolve the adversity. So instead of hope, they go to hopelessness. Instead of resilience, they just go into survival mode. They feel very helpless. So a person coming out of that now comes into adult life, and what happens when they get the slightest bit of adversity? They feel like that child who's helpless, that nobody's going to support them, I don't have tools, so in a nanosecond, they can go to hopelessness. And sadly, that's what happens for many who come out of complex trauma. That when they hit adversity today, even the mild stuff, it takes them to a place of feeling helpless and hopeless. Why bother? I can't do anything about this. And they get depressed. So... I want you to think with me about the upside of adversity. Because in complex trauma, you begin to see adversity is only a bad thing. Only a thing you can't get past. Only a thing that's going to cause you pain. Only a thing that means failure. Is that really the way adversity should be viewed? No, adversity has a wonderful upside. So just think, first of all, of this. When you want to get in shape and you go to the gym and you do push-ups or you lift weights, what are you basically saying? My muscle, in order to grow, needs adversity. My muscle will not get healthier and stronger unless it deals with adversity that's just above its normal capacity. It's not overdoing it, but it's the right amount of adversity. That's where muscles grow. That's where people grow. We need a little bit of adversity. Take that into the natural environment. Do you realize that storms, adversity, Though it can do so much damage if it's too big, actually does tremendous benefit in the right amount. Trees get pruned. It lets in more light for new growth. It gets rid of dead branches. Trees benefit so much. Storms also clean the air. Get rid of the pollution, help get rid of carbon dioxide. They water the earth so that stuff can grow. So storms in the right amount, adversity has many benefits to our environment, to our world. Let me give you some quotes. Andy Andrews has said, adversity builds muscle, adversity creates strength. Adversity, it turns out, is preparation for success. Dallin Oak says, sometimes our needed growth is achieved better by suffering and adversity than by comfort and tranquility. Napoleon Hill said, every adversity contains at the same time a seed of equivalent opportunity. If you can find a path with no obstacles, it probably doesn't lead anywhere. I like that. 
to get to the most scenic, wonderful places, you got to go through a lot of adversity. John Maxwell said, adversity is a crossroads that makes a person choose one of two paths, character or compromise. Every time he chooses character, he becomes stronger, even if that choice brings negative con consequences. Dieter Uchtdorf, it is your reaction to adversity, not the adversity itself, that determines how your life story will develop. Bernice Regan, life's challenges are not supposed to paralyze you. They're supposed to help you discover who you are. So adversity leads to greater self-awareness. Adversity has the effect of eliciting talents which in prosperous circumstances would have lain dormant. Adversity forces you to dig deep and find talent you didn't even know you had. So all of those give different upsides to adversity, the benefits that come from facing and resolving adversity. So let me just give you some tools for dealing with adversity. In parenting yourself, when you're going through a time of adversity, especially in the more extreme end, connect with other people who have gone through that same adversity or similar adversity. Why? Because when you connect with people who have been there, you don't feel so alone. They validate your pain and you need that validation. They support you. They encourage you. They motivate you to keep going. They become such an important piece in helping you stick at it as you go through that adver at adversity and to maintain the right perspective and the right attitudes. If the adversity is really extreme, don't be afraid to seek professional help. People that specialize in helping people navigate some very difficult times of adversity. That is such an important thing to keep in mind. I think when you are going through a time of adversity, it is so helpful to have one other person in your life who is a mentor who's gone through a lot of adversity. They are just so wise in how to navigate through adversity, having the right attitude, having the right perspective on it. So just learn everything you can from that person who's further down the path than you, who's been there, who's learned from it, who's benefited from it, and it shows in their life. Learn everything you can from them. And then read books of people who've gone through lots of adversity or watch documentaries or movies about people who've gone through lots of adversity because what you're going to find is the same things. You're going to just be encouraged by it. You're going to be validated. You're going to gain insights. It's going to help you so much. Next thing, remember there's a difference between self-compassion and self-pity. When you're going through adversity, you need self-compassion, not self-pity. A lot of people, when they're going through adversity, they get down on themselves. They tend to beat themselves up. That does not help. You need self-compassion. You need to treat yourself kindly. But what self-compassion also does is say, but I have to take responsibility here. I have to take ownership of my problems and find a solution. Self-pity, on the other hand, it goes to, oh, poor me, life sucks, and it sticks in that helpless, hopeless position where it just feels sorry for itself, wants everybody else to feel sorry for them, but it's not willing to do anything 
to change the problem. They want everybody else to fix them, but they're not willing to take ownership of their own choices that they need to make choices to improve the situation. Self-pity, it just makes things worse. It doesn't lead to solutions, and eventually it just drives everybody else away. Self-compassion is what you need to develop. So be kind to yourself, but take ownership in this very difficult situation. I think there's a next, a next thing that you need to do, and that is to be honest with yourself about how this adversity is affecting you. Why I say that is because for a lot of people coming out of complex trauma, when they faced adversity as a child, what their parents would do to them is to say, oh, it's not a big deal. Quit making such a big deal out of it. It's not as bad as other people. So they minimize it or they compare them to somebody else's problem. Or they say, oh, you're really not going through that. You're just making that up. They deny it. In other words, the parents didn't validate what that experience was like for the child. So the child learns to minimize their own adversity, to even to deny it. They compare themselves with others. That does not help. To deny your pain will actually prevent you from processing your pain and resolving your pain, and it ends up creating more pain. So minimization, denial, comparison, they seem to help, but they actually make things worse. The right response is to validate your pain, to say, how is this affecting me honestly? And you go, wow, I am really struggling. I am depressed, I am full of anxiety, I am angry, I am hurting. Be honest about it. That is an important starting point in getting through adversity. Now, one of the emotions that you will probably identify is I am angry. But don't stop at just the anger because in Adversity, the anger is often a secondary emotion. It's second to a primary emotion that came first that is actually the main emotion, but the anger is so intense it's covering or medicating the primary emotion. So don't stop at your anger. Say, what am I feeling under the anger? And what you're probably going to find is you're going to be deeply hurt about something, or deeply afraid, or you're gonna find there's a bunch of stuff from your past, like shame that's been triggered, and those are the primary emotions. So make sure you are curious with the anger to say what is underneath it. The next thing, be aware that adversity is going to trigger survival, fight, flight, freeze, old behaviors, old survival mode patterns. So be aware of your survival mode patterns so that you can stop yourself, catch yourself if you start going into them and say, whoa, I can't go down that road. I need to go to healthy ways of dealing with this adversity. So a couple that you need to be aware of. Be aware of how quickly you go from adversity to feeling hopeless. That is a total limbic brain response. And so you need to be able to get into your cortex and say, I feel hopeless, but I'm not hopeless. I have tools, I have support. Secondly, with that hopelessness is I feel helpless, so I must be helpless. No, you are not. Get to your cortex, no, I have tools, I have support. The next one for many people, as soon as they feel it, adversity, and then that nanosecond they feel hopeless, then they go to, well, let's quit. And on impulse, they quit lots of stuff. Don't quit. Not immediately. You might quit later down the road, 
But immediately, if that's your go-to, resist it. And say, no, I'm going to stick at this for a while because there might be some lessons I need to learn about it. Another common thing that gets triggered when you're going through adversity is I can't tell anybody about my problems. I can't tell people I'm struggling because then I would be a burden. And I don't want them to see me as a burden. So I'll just try to get through this by myself. And that can be a very bad decision. The next thing that is important is in times of adversity, they increase stress and they often require more attention be give, given to the problem, which can cause some of our other needs to not get met. Because our life is out of balance all of a sudden because of the adversity. So stop regularly and just ask yourself, how am I doing in meeting my 12 needs? Are there any of my 12 needs that are being neglected right now because of this adversity? And focus your attention on making sure you continue to meet your 12 needs because what's going to happen is if you don't do that, not only are you going to have the adversity as a problem, now you're soon going to have a second problem, which is these unmet needs, which are triggering old behaviors as well. So be very aware of your 12 needs. Next thing, just as a curiosity thing, if the adversity is coming from other people, so you're being bullied, you're being picked on, you got family members that are rejecting you and don't like you, just ask yourself, okay, I've come to realize this isn't my problem. This is their stuff. I wonder what's going on in them. Why are they feeling the need to treat me like that? And you might find that to be quite interesting to think about and quite insightful. The next thing that I encourage people to do when they face adversity is to ask themselves questions. So you remember there's three sources. It's external circumstances, others, and I bring it on myself. So I start with, when I face adversity, did I bring this on myself? Is this adversity that are, is the consequences of past choices that I have made? If so, I can't blame anybody. If so, I just have to accept this and realize it's going to take time to get through it. But start there. Am I part of the problem as to why this adversity is happening? Now, this is where you have to be tricky. If you have actually got adversity from a narcissist, they're going to tell you it's your fault. They're going to tell you it's your problem when it's not. It's totally their stuff. And so you may need help in answering this question, did I bring this on myself? Because you're going to get narcissists that tell you you did when maybe you didn't. And so we need help to sort that out. Second, is there any part of this that I can control or is this totally out of my control? The economy turning down, a severe storm that's caused your house to be destroyed. Like all of those is this out of my control or is this part of, is there part of it I can control? And then if there is a part of it I can control, so my house got knocked down by a storm, I can't control that, but I can control going to the insurance, I can control trying to figure out where to go next to live, like there's pieces that I need to do in order to handle this adversity. Third, do I need to ask others for help or is this something I must face alone? Such an important question. Do I need to involve some type of authority? So I got a boss picking on me. Do I need to go above him to his boss and report him? I got attacked. Do I need to go to the police? That becomes an important question that needs to be set, talked or answered. Next one, do I need to set a boundary? So I got a friend that keeps being negative towards me and, and, and finding fault with me. Do I just need to push that friend away? I got some family members that keep putting 
trying to manipulate me to go back to old behaviors because they don't like the changes in me? Do I need to set a boundary with them? And that leads to what would standing up for myself look like? Because often many people in adversity, they don't act because they're afraid to stand up for themselves. And so what would it look like to stand up for myself? Ask yourself that. And then the final question, adversity often requires a whole bunch of steps to get through it, and that can feel very overwhelming. So just go to what's the next step I need to take. Let's start there. That's good enough for now. The final thing that has been helpful to many, especially coming out of complex trauma, and this came out of cognitive behavior therapy, and it's the ABCs of adversity. And it's understanding that the adversity A is I'm going along and the adversity has triggered a whole bunch of stuff inside of me. Next is B, which is the belief. And then C, the consequence, and D, the disputation. So you have the adversity that triggers, and what we tend to think is that we go from A to C. That I got triggered by this adversity and all of a sudden I go to certain behaviors. And I act a certain way and I go, that's because of the adversity. And what this model is saying is, no, there's a B in there, which is our belief. That is actually what is is causing me to act certain ways. It's not the adversity. It's what I believe about the adversity as to why the adversity happened. The belief is the key part. And so there's two parts to the belief that come with complex trauma that need to be looked at. Number one, there's a lot of assumptions that I make when I go into a situation. And often they are based in shame, and those are not, those are lies. But I think they're the truth. And there's a lot of irrational beliefs based on my past. I think they're true, but they're actually false. And so I need to be able to go to D and dispute those beliefs and find out where the lies are and change the beliefs, and that will result in changed behavior. So let me give you just some examples of that. So let's say you make a mistake, and immediately you isolate from people, immediately you beat yourself up, immediately you... You don't go to social settings because you think everybody's going to be against you. You get depressed and you say, that's all because of the mistake. No, it's actually because of your beliefs about yourself, about life, about mistakes. And so what are those beliefs? You believe I made a mistake, so I'm a failure. Now everybody looks down at me. Everybody thinks I'm stupid. Nobody's going to want to be my friend. I need to punish myself before I can forgive myself. All kinds of beliefs that you have just accepted throughout life that are all shame-based beliefs. That's what causes you to isolate. That's what causes you to beat yourself up. That's the result, the cause of all of the stuff that you're going through. And so those beliefs need to be understood and changed if the behavior is to be changed. This one, you're moving to a new school or a new job and you don't know anyone. Drop right down to the consequence. You're afraid that you go to this new place, you don't talk to anybody, and so you don't make many friends. Somebody, some people end up thinking you're snobby and you never, and because of that, you just don't feel good about yourself. And you might say, that's just because I moved to a new place. That's why I'm acting this way. No, it's because of your beliefs, your assumptions, your irrational thinking that comes out of complex trauma, which says, I'm moving to a new place. I don't think I'm much of a catch. I don't think I'm very good. So probably nobody's going to want to be my friend. So I'm going to be very 
shy, I'm not, I'm not going to do stuff socially, and you cut yourself off from people, or you go, oh, they're not going to like me, so I'm not going to like them, I'm, I'm going to be negative about this job right from the get-go, all because of your beliefs. Now, what came out of that is the realization that, and there's two models side by side that basically say the same thing. Our thoughts affect our emotions. Our thoughts affect our behaviors. But then our emotions affect our thoughts and our emotions affect our behaviors. And then what we do affects what we think and what we feel. So there's this constant interplay between thoughts, emotions, and behaviors that feed each other, that influence each other. And so part of what we're doing in adversity is we're trying to figure out thoughts, the emotions, behaviors, what's influencing each other, what's accurate, what's based on beliefs from complex trauma. Because if I don't sort all of that out, I'm going to be in big trouble. So that's the topic of adversity. We all face it. None of us like it. It's the, one of those least like realities of life that we have to learn how to get through. But if we learn the tools, we can grow so much through adversity. We can grow in ways we never would otherwise. And it can be one of the greatest blessings of our life. So I hope that that helps you. That's the end of part one. We're going to take a short break and I'm going to come back for part two, which is the Christian part. If that doesn't interest you, not a problem. We're not offended. You're free to go. We'll see you next week. For everybody else, I'll be back in just a minute. I want to tell you the story of the prodigal son, and maybe it's in a way that you've never heard it before. So the word prodigal, it basically means reckless. And so when we tell the story, we talk about the reckless son. That, so it's reckless because you went outside of the rules, you went outside of what was normal, what went outside of what was considered healthy, went into all this extravagant, crazy, reckless living, so we call it the prodigal son. But most scholars would teach and believe that the real purpose of the story was really about the prodigal God. That God's love was reckless. So let me explain how that goes and why Jesus is telling that in his story. So the last few weeks we talked about shame, and the last time I said, do you ever thought about how shame affects how we view God? And my point was, is that shame causes us to feel I'm not good enough, I, I, something's wrong with me, I, and I have all of these negative feelings inside, and so it's easy to begin to think God must be mad at me, God must be looking down at me, God must be going to punish me, God must be very upset. And so shame causes us to change our view of God from a loving, forgiving God to a God that is angry and distant and not caring and uninvolved. And that comes out of shame. And so when Jesus came along, the Jewish religion had developed a shame religion with a shame view of God. So let me give it to you another way. I want you to picture two chairs, two chairs facing each other. So this is the Garden of Eden. God, Adam and Eve, talking to each other every day. Two chairs facing each other, perfect harmony, communion, connection. Adam and Eve turn their chair. Now what a shame religion says is you dishonored. It's all about honor. So you look at honor cultures today. If a child makes their dad look bad, if their child does something that dishonors dad, 
what then is required before the relationship can be restored? Well, dad turns his chair. And now you have to make up for the dishonor before dad will turn his chair back to you. So you could have turned your chair, but dad turned his chair. Now you could try to get back with dad, but that's not going to be possible until you compensate for how you dishonored him. So that was the religion at the time of Jesus. It was an honor-based religion, a shame-based religion. So that's why Jesus tells the story of the prodigal son. Because he wants to show them that an honor-based, shame-based religion is not the true religion. So, in that culture, their view of God was that God was this distant, honor statesman of the family, like in the culture. Now, in that culture, do you realize that an older man always had to look dignified when he was in public? Therefore, an older man would never run in public. That was undignified. That would make him look immature. So it was all about projecting an image of dignified. An older man would never hug or kiss somebody in public. That was undignified. Immature people did that. He had to be stoic, under control, dignified all the time. So what's the story of the prodigal son? The son says to his father, give me my inheritance. Well, dad hasn't even died yet. So what is he basically saying? I wish you were dead, dad. I don't like you. I wish you were dead so I could get my money. So this father does something very undignified. He gives the son the money before he died. And the son takes that money and goes and spends it in a foreign land on all kinds of wild living, we're told. Everything that would break his father's heart. And the fact that we're told he ends up in a pig farm, taking care of pigs, basically says he's gone to Gentiles, away from the Jewish people, so he's getting as far away from his father's religion, his father's beliefs, everything that his father stood for, he's gone the opposite direction, as far as he can, and then a famine hits, he has no food, he has to take care of pigs, which for a Jewish boy was the ultimate in what you don't do. And then he has to eat pig food to try to get enough food. In that place of pain, he hits a bottom. All the rebellion breaks out of him. All of the lies he's believed, he can now see are nothing but lies. And he said, it was so much better with my father. I'm going to go back and I'm going to repent. I'm going to turn my chair back and I'm going to try to get connected again to my father. But in that culture, the Pharisees would have said, uh, no way, no God is going to forgive that kid. You realize how many ways that kid's dishonored God? Do you realize how many things that kid has to make up for to restore the honor of his father before his father can turn his chair? And so Jesus says, you all know what happened to this father? He was sitting on the front porch waiting for him, looking down the road. His chair was never turned the other way. His chair remained turned towards his son the whole time. And as soon as he saw his son, what did he do? He ran. He broke the rules. He was reckless. He was prodigal. He did what was not to be done. And then he hugged him and he kissed him in public. Reckless, 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 prodigal. No God would do that, the Pharisees would say. And Jesus says, you got the wrong God. 
You've come to believe in a God that is not the true God. This God never turned his chair away from his son. This God does not require his son to somehow pay for the dishonor. All he cares for is a repentant heart. And when that repentant heart shows up, he's there. And he's making a scene and he's throwing a party. That's the God. That is the true God. And so Jesus is fighting a system of religion that thought they were honoring God by making him so dignified. But they were dishonoring and misrepresenting God. And what Jesus was saying is God is a God of prodigal love that doesn't fit within your nice, neat rules of how God should act. He goes outside the rules recklessly. He's not about his own honor and making sure everybody honors him properly. He's about restoring. He's about reconnecting with those who want to. He's not about punishing and making them pay first. He's about restoration. And I love that we don't have a shame-based religion and a shame-based God. Let's pray. Father, just thank you for our evening together. Lord, for people who've come out of shame and seen you as a God who's angry at them, who's turned their chair away from them, I just hope and pray that you would help them realize you've never turned your chair, that they just need to turn back to you. There's forgiveness, that you want a relationship with them, and that you would just... Help them to reconnect and to find the healing that you so badly want them to have. Amen. Well, thank you so much for being here tonight. Hopefully it's been a blessing to you.